Good morning. It is so good to be back up here preaching. I tell you what, I've been out of the pulpit for three weeks. I kind of, I've been telling Lydia all week, I kind of feel sorry for the people because who knows what I'm going to say. I got like three, work, three weeks worth of, uh, of energy and emotion pent up. Uh, that's not the point of the pulpit, but uh, sometimes it's just good to be back. That's the point. That's the point. I even told Lydia, who's sitting right here, I was sitting beside her, and I said, uh, I'm a little nervous. Like, I'm never, never nervous when I get up to preach. But it's not nervous like I'm afraid I'm going to lay an egg or anything. It's just that, uh, although I might, uh, <laughs> figuratively speaking, um, it's just that I'm so excited to be back, so excited to get to, to bring God's word to you. We have a few more weeks in the book of Genesis, and, um, and then we move on. Uh, and so I want to close our time in Genesis out well so that uh, it's, it's a resource that you can come back to in the future. Maybe your notes that you take, uh, maybe just the, the belief systems that have been developed over the last however many weeks we've been in Genesis. Uh, maybe the resource online of all of the sermons that I've preached. Uh, I want us to finish well in the book of Genesis and then it'll be a resource that we can draw from in the future. But before we go into the book of Genesis, there's something that I want to tell you about. <clears throat> they're dialing my voice in because they've had it dialed in for Billy and Andre's voice the last few weeks, so they're dialing mine in. I'm going to get a lot louder just so you know, so, so you can keep that in mind as I, as I preach um, and as you dial it in. Uh, it's sounding good, sounding good. Um, so every year and a half or so, like over the last seven years, uh, maybe... Maybe four or five times I have said to you something uh, like, uh, like what we're about to do is, is so important that it's, it's game changing. Only a few times in the course of, of our existence as a fairly new church, a fairly young church, only a few times have I said uh, what we're about to do, what's coming up this fall, what's coming up this spring, what, what we're about to do is going to, to shift our culture a bit as a church. Man, man I hope if I were to ask you, uh, like, like, do you think I like say things like all the time, super, you know, melodramatically, and then I don't come through? I would hope you would say, no, you don't tend to do that. Like, when you tell us something big is coming and we're going to, like, it's going to shift our direction, then you mean it. Like, I, I hope you would say that. I, I tend to think that I'm that kind of a, a guy, that kind of a pastor, that I don't just blow smoke, but that that I save my words, you know, or when I say like, boy, we're in crisis, that like, like, I don't say that until we really are. Or when I say like, we're, we're headed in a new direction, uh, and I don't want to use new direction, but we're, we're shifting our culture, our direction here. When I say that, I, I want you to really say, well, that must be true because Randy has a track record of telling us the truth. So, so, uh, what, what, what's coming up Beginning September 8th is, is a, new, a new teaching series. It is a, a new um, it, it is a new uh, a new season for us as a church. Uh, it is I'm struggling for word. I just remember it's a new campaign, not like money raising campaign. Don't think that we don't have those here. Uh, but it, just a new uh, for, for 10 weeks. Everything that we do with our little babies, uh, with our old people, with our young adults, and with our retired people, and with ICON, our high school ministry, everything is going to flow through this campaign. By the way, you recognize that building? You recognize that space? First person that, 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 can, that can identify that space, besides the photographer who is here, gets a big Yahoo from Lydia. There you go. Go ahead, Lydia. There you go. All right. Yay. Yeah. That's Seventh and Park. Um, Daniela Loetta, who is here up here doing the announcements, she does all of our graphics. She's an amazing artist. 
uh, just amazing person, uh, amazing artist. And so she, she does all, all of our graphics now. If you've noticed that we've really upped our, our, our graphics, she, she's doing all these. And, and this, uh, this is a picture from Seventh Apart. Community Matters is a 10, is a 10 week, <clears throat> a 10 week campaign, a 10 week series that is, is set to, to refocus our direction as a church. Uh, kind of a corrective measure. Not that we're in a bad spot, but we just, we're always correcting. We're always shifting, or, or not shifting, but, but yeah, correcting our, our course a bit. And, and so, so the, the 10 weeks of Community Matters is really, is really intended to, to correct our course over the next year and over the next several years. If I took off, and I really can't do this, but if I could take off my pastor's hat for just a moment and just say, like, if I'm just a member, if I'm just a, a parishioner, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a part of this community of faith, one thing that, that I desire, one thing that really, I guess, burdens me, maybe I shouldn't say this, but, but, but I'm going to, and that is that, that, that for us at, at River Church, like, we're barely friends. Like, like some of us are, are really, really good friends, but... But, but for many of us, we're, we're just like barely friends, you know? So we have to come and kind of cover and can't really be totally honest, not because we're dishonest, but just like you don't want to vomit all your emotions on somebody that's just barely a friend. Uh, I think we can go deeper. I think that Christ calls us to go deeper. In fact, I think it is imperative based on the gospel teachings of Jesus that we as a church really grow as a community. Where we're going to the movies together and we're... We're eating out together, and we're to, to steal a phrase of, of one of my friends who was in my gospel community last night, where we have this, where we have this, uh, this culture where we can, we can talk to our unbelieving friends, and we can say, come with. Like, we're, we're going to the movies. Come with. Go, go eat with us. Come over for game night. A culture shifting uh, sort of a, a season. That's what I want the 10 weeks Beginning, beginning on Wednesday night, September 11th. I start preaching the series Sunday, September 8th. The, a culture-changing experience. That's what I want this to be for us as a church. And so, so what we're going to do is I'm going to preach it on Sundays. And then we're going to come back on Wednesday nights. And we're going to have tables. We're going to have table groups. For 10 weeks, if you're in a gospel community, it'll be happening here. Not, not there, but here. Not because that's necessarily our end goal, but that is the, the impetus, the, the beginning of, I think, something that's going to be great and big and, and, and awesome for us as a church. So for 10 weeks, beginning Wednesday, September 11th, we'll be here. Every Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we'll, uh, we'll have a dinner for you. It'll cost like 2 or 3 bucks. Cheapest meal in town. We'll have dinner for you. I'll do a little bit of teaching, but mostly just facilitating. You as a table, will uh, in your different table groups, we'll just have a good time growing closer as friends and talking about our community, River Church. But see, this, this title, it's, it's got a double meaning. You may get that from the photo. Like community matters because we are the body of Christ. We are a community. But, but also, we're a smaller community within a larger community, and that is uh, Brownsville and the RGV where a lot of us grew up, where a lot of us have, have um, devoted our lives to. Like, no, 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 we don't have to live here. We choose to live here because we love this community. And so, so we, we are a smaller community within a, a larger community. And so there's kind of a double meaning, not kind of, there is a double meaning to this title that community matters, right? But community matters. And all the evangelistic sort of implications of those, fra of those two phrases or those two meanings, that's what we're going to be talking about beginning on Sunday, September 8th, and then, and then our, our, our time together with a meal and, and small groups, Wednesday the 11th. So I'm, 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 super, I'm super stoked about this. I, uh, I just want to pray. And then we won't talk about it anymore. I could talk your ear off about this. I've been having lunch with different people, and like that's all I talk about. But for now, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop. You know, know more about it. I'll tell you more about it another day. Let's pray. God, I do pray for for deeper community.
I'm, I'm just drawn, God, to your words, to Jesus' words, when he, when he gathered together with 11 of his, of his closest friends. And he said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. By this will, will all people know that you are my disciples. God, I pray, I, I pray earnestly, I pray with a deep desire that you would grow us deeper as a community this fall. That we might truly be friends, that we might truly be a people who love each other. Yes, we want to love the world, but, but it begins by us live, loving one another. God, would you do that? Would you begin, even now, don't, you don't have to wait till September 8th, God. But would you do that in us, through us? Would you bless this, this campaign? <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a program. We'll admit that. But God, would you bless it so that it's not just a program, so that it is, it is the supernatural working of the Holy Spirit in our church for good change? Would you, would you do that? Would you begin that? Would you begin to stir in us a new desire, a deeper desire to grow as friends and to grow in our love that, that you might build for yourself a, a people, um, a family, um, a body of Christ here in Brownsville. I pray that, 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 that growth and, 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 and fruitfulness would come out of this, God. And it would be your doing, the work of the Holy Spirit. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, a few more weeks in Genesis. <clears throat> I want you to look at a phrase that uh, we're going to come back to here in a minute. Uh, it's sort of the title of, the, of, of today's teaching out of, uh, out of the book of Genesis. How true this is of me. If, if you want to understand, if you want an explanation of what this phrase, what this title means, I'll develop it as we go. But, but how true this is of me, how perhaps true this is of you. That we're amazed by our circumstances and really, quite frankly, a bit bored by God's grace. I recently had a disappointment in, in my life. Uh, it was nothing... Uh, like you would think it's no big deal to me. It was a major big deal, right? Because it was, it was my disappointment. Uh, I'm fine. Uh, but I had this disappointment, something that I wanted to do that I didn't get to do, something that I looked forward to and, and I, I wanted it to happen and it didn't happen. And so I did probably what most of you would do. I threw a pity party. I felt sorry for myself. I thought, thought how it's like, like when, you, when your kids, like when your kids in the back seat say, no fair, right? But except it was like me doing that as a 50-year-old man. Like, this isn't fair. And um, I was mostly because cause I want people to think uh, better of me than I am in reality. I didn't say that to many people. Uh, I think I said it to the elders, and, and I said it to myself, that this, this isn't fair, that I don't get my way. I don't get what I want. And then I thought about my heart, my, my heart's attitude. So I thought about my circumstances, that I wasn't getting what I wanted. And then I thought about my heart and, and the condition of my heart. And I, I, was, I was attempting to pray through this. And I said to God, I said, I said, God, uh, don't you see? Like, I really wanted this, wanted this circumstance. You see my circumstances? And, 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 and I... I thought about, I thought about this this picture that I've heard a, heard another pastor describe one time. But except God was speaking to me through this this picture, this this, this sort of symbol or vision, and that is a picture of like a like a newspaper rolled up, right, where you can just look through it and you you only see like what is in the middle of that circle there, and and although God is certainly able to see everything and. He knows all your junk, and he knows all my junk, and he knows the whole world's, you know, he's, he's read our mail. Uh, but at that moment in time, it was as though God was saying, I, I would say, you see my circumstances, and it was as though God was saying, you know, Randy, I look at you, I, I just, I look at your heart. 
and, and I said, you know, I, like I'm, I'm justified in feeling the way that I do because of my circumstances. And, and I felt as though God was saying, but Randy, I care about your heart. I'm just looking, I'm just looking at it's you, your response to these circumstances. Yeah, I know your circumstances. I've brought them to pass. But the Lord was saying to me, but what I care about is your heart and what's going on inside. I... And then I thought about the sovereignty of God. That's a big theological word. It means his, his rule, his dominion, his jurisdiction, his authority and his control. And, and I thought maybe, maybe just maybe, God had withheld this this thing that I wanted to come to pass, perhaps what I wanted was, was being withheld because, because of, of, of some good that God intended to bring about in my life. There was this disappointment that I had, but, but God wasn't trying to disappointment, uh, disappoint me. Rather, God was bringing this, this bad circumstance together for my good. At that moment in time, I was, I was acting like a hedonist. We're talking more about this later today, but, but see, I'm not a hedonist, uh, except I am sometimes, but what I, what I claim to be is a Christian. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't claim to be um, anything other than a Christ follower, and I hold to the teachings of Jesus, and I hold to the ethics of the Bible, and I, and I follow Jesus as my leader. But in that moment in time, I was a hedonist. We're going to talk about this later, so I want you to at least see the, 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 the definition. Someone who believes um, the pursuit of pleasure is the most important thing in life. And so it wasn't as though I was, I was pursuing something that was wicked or bad, but I just wanted what I wanted. Like, just give me what I want. And I was, I was talking with a friend last Sunday about this issue and, and what this friend reminded me of is something that I say all the time. This friend was preaching to me, but it was, it was like, that's my, that's my line. That's my material. It was, it was you've heard me say this before, but, but here's where it, it really hit home for me, and that is that, that we don't mostly need God to change our circumstances. We think we do, and, and we, we pray about our circumstances 99.9% .9 of the time, and I think that there's a beauty in that. It's like a child coming to his daddy and saying, won't you help me with my problems? And there's a beauty in that, but, but, but as we mature in Christ, what I think think we need to realize more and more is that we don't mostly need God to, to, to fix our circumstances. I need God to fix my heart. I, I really don't have a circumstance problem. I have a heart problem. And maybe you walked in here this morning with a with a circumstance problem, and I don't, um, I don't make light of that at all. Maybe you're sick physically, and the elders, our role is to anoint your head with oil and pray for God's healing in your life. Maybe you've come in here with just a relational wreck, or maybe you've come in here, um, whatever burden of your circumstance you've brought with you this morning. I don't make light of that at all, but I would, I would continue to say as your pastor, that is not your biggest issue. Maybe you've come in here and you've said like, oh my God, I'm lonely and I don't have any friends. Why haven't you given me any friends? And, and maybe God would say, well, I, I have, look around. And you'd say, well, but like, nobody here is like me. Like, I, I don't, these aren't my friends friends. I don't, like God, I want friends, but, and God would say, but I've given you friends. And, and, and it just speaks again to the issue that, that our circumstances, it's not that they're not important, but, but at the end of the day, what we mostly need is for God to change our hearts. You see young people here today, young adults and, and, and old people here today, 
which you're, anybody that's older than me, you're old. Um, <clears throat> that's, that's eventually how that works out. Um, <laughs> all of us, every one of us in this room, you see your circumstances, they're going to change. I mean, unless you, and I hope this doesn't happen anytime soon, but unless you die, unless you die, unless your circumstances kill you, they will get better. They always do. They always get better. Like our lowest, like that low water mark, the, the water eventually comes back up. Well, whatever, the, the, whatever circumstance you're going through, not to make light of it, but, but what you're worried about today won't be an issue in a few years. You'll have something new to worry about, but it won't be this. The point is, your circumstances always improve for the better if you wait. If you wait on the Lord, unless you die, and then your circumstances get way better way fast, right? But, it, but, it, but, but your circum, you wait on the Lord, your circumstances always get better. But your heart, without the supernatural healing uh, of the Holy Spirit, your heart will not automatically get better. Your, your heart may 40 years from now be just as sick as it is today. Because we don't mostly have a circumstance problem. We mostly have a heart problem. And it doesn't work itself out on its own. You will not naturally change. Not in eternal, spiritual. No, it, it takes the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. That, that part of you may never change. You, you could have the same broken heart decades from now. We don't mostly need God to change our circumstances, but rather our hearts. Heal my heart, O oh Lord. So Joseph... <laughs> Joseph, uh, he's the character at the end of the book of Genesis. And uh, <clears throat> he's probably the, the most well-known character, the most uh, colorful character. See what I did there? Uh, the most colorful character in, uh, in, in the book of Genesis uh, if you maybe you haven't read the Bible, but maybe you watched like a movie about Joseph and his coat of many colors. Remember his he he was born into a super jacked up situation where his uh, his dad uh, you know his dad uh, favored him over his other brothers, and it was this long line. We've already talked about this weeks past, but this long line of dysfunction that's passed from, from parents to children and, and several generations old now. Uh, Joseph was born in this situation, and it sounds like it'd be good to be the, the favored son that gets the, the coach. you got to wear the coat every day, and every, uh, all 11 bro of your brothers hate you because like you got that coat on because like yeah we didn't forget you're the favored son uh, but but actually Joseph as you know because you've studied his circumstances were dire um, you, you recall you recall that Joseph the, the brother the favored brother uh, you'd think things would work out for him because he's favored but not so he um, was sold he was sold by his brother into a foreign land. And like we tend to clean that up because it's the Bible, so it must not have been that bad. No, it was bad. It would be like if your siblings sold you, like took you to Mexico and sold you into some slave trade situation. Like it was that bad. Let's not clean it up. God doesn't need for us to clean these stories up. Uh, he was sold into slavery. Uh, he became a child slave and then an adolescent slave. And then uh, you recall he rose to prominence uh, as a household slave, that was a, that was a step up for him. That's how bad his life was. Uh, he was a household slave uh, to a military leader in Egypt, and, and, and he, was, 
He, he rose to some sort of prominence there in this, in this large household, and then he was falsely accused uh, by his boss's wife. He was falsely accused of rape, and he was thrown into a rat-infested dungeon. Uh, we don't have any, any uh, context because we don't have dungeons, but this was a rat-infested dungeon where you were left to, to, to rot and die. Talking about Joseph's circumstances here, because if anybody could say, like, my circumstances the, the, are, my, are my greatest problem, Joseph probably could. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to test that, though. Uh, so, so, so then, then he's, he's in a, in a rat-infested dungeon where he's been left to rot and die. He's tried on his own to bust out in a few ways by, like, uh, interpreting people's dreams and be like, don't forget me when you get on the outside. You know, look me up. Get me out of here. And, and, and he just, but, but nothing works. He's stuck in this dungeon. And then according to the, the, the providential hand of God, the sovereign, controlling, authoritative hand of God, um, according to circumstances that I don't have time to explain today or go into detail about, Joseph, he's busted out of the, 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 the dungeon. And he's invited, uh, he's invited into the royal court where he interprets this dark, prophetic dream that Pharaoh, that's the king of Egypt, uh, a dream that Pharaoh had dreamt. And so he goes from being probably sores all over his body and emaciated uh, from starvation. He goes from that to being like, take a bath, clean up, Put some cologne on. You're going to see the king. He wants you to. He, he he hears you can do these tricks, and he wants you to interpret his dream. Except his tricks were actually um, God breathed, um, Holy Spirit empowered uh, gifts. Joseph could truly interpret dreams. And so he did this, the meaning of the dream. Uh, it's important that you know this for, for our future conversation, or for our future studies. The meaning of the dream, Joseph explains to Pharaoh. He explains to Pharaoh that, that in Egypt, and see, Egypt was a very important uh, hub or center of the world. You know, there are a few places that, that rise to the occasion that God causes to be centers uh, of, of, of commerce and industry and art, and Egypt was that. And, and, so, so, and, he, and this is the king of Egypt. And, and, and the Pharaoh, Pharaoh I'm sorry, uh, uh, Joseph explains to the Pharaoh that, that the whole world, Egypt and the whole world, will experience seven years, seven years of plenty. That means fertile farm crops, food on the table, Everybody's fat and happy, right? But then, but then he explains your dream, the interpretation of your dream also says that after seven years of plenty, there will be seven years of want. Seven years of severe famine. God intends to do this. God intends to bring us seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of want. No food, no drink, water scarce, our crops will die, severe famine. And at the hand of God, this pagan king, Pharaoh, uh, takes this slave boy, Joseph, out of the dungeon, and makes him second in command in the whole country of Egypt, a pagan country. And here's what he says. He says, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. And only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph's circumstances are now all of a sudden looking up. So this is where we pick up. <clears throat> this is where we begin reading Genesis 41. I'm going to 
I'm going to move real fast now, not through the reading of Scripture, but through my, my teaching after we read this. I'm going to, I'm going to move quickly today. Uh, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Well, he'd done a lot of living in 30 years. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years the earth produced abundantly. And he gathered up all the food of these seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt and put the food in the cities. And he put in every city the food from the fields around it. And Joseph stored up grain in great abundance. Like the sand of the sea. Until he ceased to measure it. For it could not be measured. He stored away that much food. He said, forget it. We can't even... Our accountants, our, our bean counters, are, are, they're, they're, they've, they've gone on strike. There's just too much to keep track of. We won't even keep track anymore. Before the year of famine came, before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On, bore them to him. That's his wife. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For he said, God has made me forget all my hardship. And all my father's house, Manasseh's name meant something like that. We'll talk about that. The name of the second he called Ephraim. For God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come as Joseph had said. As God has told, had told Joseph. Therefore, uh, there was famine in all lands. But in the land of Egypt, there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. What he says to you, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses uh, and sold to the Egyptians, for the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, moreover all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain. Next, in the next few weeks, we'll see Joseph be, being reacquainted with his father and his brothers, and this is why. God brought about this worldwide famine, brought Joseph's family back to Joseph, and now he feeds them, he saves them. We'll, I'm getting ahead of myself. We'll talk about that. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to, to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth the word of the Lord for which I give thanks. So what do we have? Joseph, who had been through the most dire form of suffering that one can imagine, is now raised to the position of prominence. And he gets married, and he has kids. I love kids. You guys know that. Um, and so I'm, I'm immediately interested in these boys' names. And so here's what we have. We have Manasseh, his, his older son. And it sounds like, in, in the Hebrew language, uh, it sounds like the word for making to forget. And, and, then, and then he has his next son, and he, he names this son Ephraim, which sounds like the Hebrew word for making faithful. So what's going on here is that Joseph is writing this, uh, like this beautiful poetic summary of his life, and he's doing it in through the names of his children. Some of you have spent much time choosing the, your children's name, wanting to speak some some sense of of a poetic meaning over your children. Well, that's what Joseph is doing here. Uh, he's saying he is saying God has. His, uh, I went through all the tragedy. I went through all the circumstances. I went through all of the trials. God did all that in my life. But now he is making me to forget. He has delivered me from those days. And, 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 now, and now he is making himself faithful in my life. He took me through the storm. He took me through the desert. God did that. But 
now he is, his, he is making his faithfulness known. Oh, that I might be able to sing that type of poetry over my own life. That you might be able to do that. Find strength in, in the meaning and depth of meaning and all the difficulties that you've gone through. Yeah, when I was a boy, we used to sing <clears throat> Amazing Grace all the time. You probably did too if you grew up in the church, right? And, and, and we speak of God's amazing grace. Yeah. I just listened to a sermon by R.C. Sproul this last week in which he said that the truth is we are not really amazed by God's grace. What we're really amazed by is, is the circumstances that we go through. As if we, are to say, as if we say to God, how dare you? I, I can't, I'm amazed that you would do this, God. What kind of a good God would... I, I am amazed by my circumstances. I'm a bit bored by your grace. But how dare you? Because we are caught up on our circumstances... When, when, when God cares, yes, about your circumstances, but, it, but he, he cares about the eternal state of your heart. Joseph went through trials of abuse and, and abandonment and character assassination and imprisonment, and disease. No doubt in the prison at some point he must have said, God, why would you let this happen? We ask that. This week we have asked that question, right? Maybe you, maybe you did, didn't dare say, that, say it out loud to a friend, but you said it silently to God. How, how, why would you let this happen? And in, in Joseph's life, sorry, in Joseph's life, uh, God didn't stop or prevent. In fact, he ordained it for good. We'll look at it again in a few weeks. We've looked at several places where Joseph says, God did this. That the, he did it for good. He did it that the world might be saved. He did this for good. Now, what you're going through today, here's the point. What you're going through today, friends, take heart. You're in good company. Like, you're in the company of Joseph. You're in the company of Moses. By the way, you're in the company of Jesus. The Bible says that Jesus embraced the cross for, for the good that he knew would be on the other side. He embraced it. You're going through difficult circumstances today and you're wondering, how can a good God? And what I want you to take heart in is you are in good company. Jesus said, he made it clear, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I will overcome the world. And now, by God's grace, now we get to see the story. I can't promise you that you're going to ultimately one day have an aha moment and know exactly why you've been sick or exactly why that person left you. I don't know that you will ever, on this side of eternity, uh, know why. Um, that's where trust in, in, in God's goodness comes into play. I don't know, but, but thankfully in this story, we do know what became of, how, by God's grace, good came out of the, the, the wretched wreck of a life that, that Joseph had to leave, live for 30 years. The good was this. Number one, by God's grace, by God's grace, Joseph, at the, at the tender young age of 30, uh, Joseph is now quite literally the Savior, little s, the Savior of the world. And Joseph tells his brothers several times, this is why God did this, that I might come ahead to Egypt and I might be the Savior, your Savior, but more broadly, the little s, Savior of the world in this time of famine, which God ordained. So we know that that good came out of it. What else came out of this? 
um, this 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 life that, 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 that Joseph, all of his circumstances. The second thing is this. Joseph is now, he has become a sincere man of faith. Do you remember Joseph just several weeks ago or a month ago when we were studying Joseph? He was a punk teenager. He was arrogant. He walked with a swagger. He told, he, 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 not, only, not only was he having prophetic dreams, he was like rubbing it in the face of his brothers. He was destined to be just as dysfunctional and just, bro, just as broken as his father and his grandfather. Through these dire circumstances, through this wretched life that he's lived now for several decades, he now steps out of it a seasoned man of faith. I often wonder, and I'm not going to answer this question, but I often wonder at, at, at 30 or at 50, um, if Joseph, if, if we would ask him, if he would say, no need to change any of my circumstances. Let me go through all of it. It was all for good. I think he would say that because that's what he said to his brothers. Brothers, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. What if you could say that to your perpetrator today? The, 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 the person who has wronged you the most. When we go through suffering, we deal with it in several ways. When you go through suffering, when I go through suffering, I don't know, maybe you're better than me, but it's my, it's my junk. Uh, when, I, when I go through suffering, there, I have like four different choices. Only three of them holds to a Christian ethic. I mean, only one of them, rather, holds to a Christian ethic. Only one of these ways in which we respond uh, to suffering is really Christ-like, meaning that it's parallel to the teachings of Jesus. The first three aren't. The last one is, one of the ways we do it is, I pretend it didn't happen. Like it's all make-believe, right? There's some, there's some uh, philosophical stuff that, 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 that has happened over the last several decades that I won't, um, I won't, even, I won't even get into it. But, but this, sort of, this sort of like, you know, my pain and suffering, it's not reality. It's just make-believe. It's just, I'm just going to overcome it with the power of my mind. Most of you aren't that weird, so you probably don't do that. But sometimes I try that. It doesn't work. And it doesn't hold to a Christian ethic. There's a second way that we deal with uh, suffering, and that is we call it random. It's like just totally lacking in purpose, you know? If I would have turned right today, I wouldn't have been struck by a bus, but just randomly I turned left and I got hit by a bus. Purposeless, random, no meaning to life. That's pretty sick, but a third even sicker way of looking at life is this. I am just cursed. I've known people like this. It's such a terrible hole to dig for yourself. I'm just cursed, man. God just hates my guts. There's an only, uh, only, only the fourth response to suffering is really in, uh, in line with the teachings of Jesus. And that, we, that is we say that it's purposeful. That it's purposeful. And, 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 and the truth of the matter is, it's only purposeful if, if it's true that we are purpose-built for eternity rather than just these, you know, 80, 90, 100 years that we're going to live. See, if we're only going to live 80 or 90 years, then, then suffering sucks. It like makes no sense at all. It's like a bummer. It's, it's not purposeful. But, but if we live in light of eternity and eternity is really true and we're purpose built uh, as human beings to live for eternity, then and only then, then and only then is suffering purposeful. Can it be purposeful? I wasn't smart enough to come up with that, that, that teaching. That's the teaching of the Apostle Paul. He says it like this. If, what do I gain if 
Humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus. If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Now, that's really wordy. Uh, there's probably some paraphrases in other, in other translations of the Bible that would, might, might, might make, it, make sense of this uh, for you. But let me, let me just explain what he's saying here. Number one, most scholars would say that Paul probably did not get thrown into one of these um, these Colosseum type situations where they throw you in there with wild beasts and wild beasts just like rip you apart. Most people, most scholars would say that that's probably, he's probably not speaking literally that he fought with beasts. Probably what he's saying is, he, if, if you've ever read uh, the book of Acts or you, you know the context, what happened to him when he was planting a church in Ephesus? Men tr treated him terribly. He's probably talking about those gross men that he had to deal with. Like the guys that you, you know, that you have to deal with at the office every day. Uh, you know, like, like he had, he's thinking back and he's like, I had to put up with all that, you know, all that. Um, those beasts. In planting the church in Ephesus, it could have gone a lot easier, but I had to deal with those beasts. And then what he's saying is, if the dead are not raised, in other words, all this that I've been preaching, eternal life, and, 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 and you follow Jesus in this life, and, and you're rewarded with a new heaven and new earth and eternity with the Father, a child of God. He says, if that's not true, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, be merry, for tomorrow we die. Now, some, some, some would say, I've heard people say this, like, even if Jesus didn't walk out of the tomb, even if all this stuff isn't true, church is still a good place to be. Like, like my kids learn some good ethics in life. We learn how to share, and, and we, learn, we learn a lot of good teachings. The, the Ten Commandments are, are, are great, a great way to live your life, even if Jesus didn't walk out of the tomb, even if eternal life isn't real. Uh, some would say, hey, it's still a sensible response to disappointment. Even if there's no heaven, even if there's no hell, the, 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 a sensible uh, response to, to disappointment, even if there's no purpose to life, still a sensible uh, response would be keep your chin up, right? Get out of bed every morning, be courageous, ha be, be determined. And, and, and I would say for me, no. For me personally, I'm, being, I'm, being I'm always honest. I'm being completely honest. I I'm not just putting on a show. I'm about to say, I absolutely believe this. No, if life is meaningless and random and I am suffering needlessly, I'm with Paul. I say, where's the nearest bar? That's why I have so much friend, so much sympathy for my friends who, whose lives are a train wreck. I get it. Man, I think if, if there is no eternal life and if we do not hold to the Christian ethic, uh, the teachings of Jesus, you, you and I, if we don't, then I think the hedonist life is the best life. It's the life for me. It's said, I read this quote um, this week. Uh, it's out of a commentary critical and exp ex explanatory on the whole Bible by Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown. And the quote goes like this. If men but persuade themselves that they shall die like beasts, they soon will live like beasts also. In other words, if, if there is no eternal life, if there is no purpose in life, then, then we just live like beasts and die like beasts. Hedonism, for me, has always made sense if there is no heaven and there is no hell and there is no purpose to life. Here's why I bring this up. You're like, why are we talking about hedonism? Here's why I bring this up. Because some of us in this room today, we are functioning as hedonists. Not Christians, but hedonists. You remember what a hedonist is? Someone who believes the pursuit of the, the pursuit of pleasure is the most important thing in life. Now you'd say, probably most of you in this room would be like, stop, Randy. We're, I'm not a hedonist. I come to church. I give a little money. I don't cheat on my wife. Maybe virtually, but other than that, I don't cheat on my wife. And, 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 and you call me a hedonist. Come on, stop, Randy. R.C. Sproul says there are two types of hedonism. Uh, 
the first form, yeah, you probably, you know, you're better now, right? It's always going to be better than somebody, right? Because then you feel good about yourself. So crude hedonism would be seeking physical pleasure to the maximum degree through food and drink and unbridled sex and seeking to gratify every lust and satisfy every appetite. And, and, and that's, you know, some of us live there. A lot of us don't. Like, we've grown beyond that. We've matured. You know, we duck and cover. We, 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 we keep our passions, uh, you know, like, uh, like the flame. Like, uh, we keep it burning low. But how about the second form of hedonism, refined hedonism? It's simply the attainment of pleasure and the avoidance of pain as like your life's ethic. Like that is, that is your greatest goal. That is your end. Some of us here, our highest goal in life is, is, is just attaining pleasure and, and, and avoiding pain and just getting through this life. And that's fine if you're a hedonist, but if you're a Christ follower, that's no way to live. And, and if this is you, man, if, 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 if hedonism makes sense to you and you're a refined hedonist, then, then what I would say is don't tell your neighbor about Jesus unless you're able to tell them about the power and the presence of, of, of Christ in your life, then, then don't sell them a bill of goods. I mean, if... if, if there is no eternal life, then this is the best way to live. Ah, oh, but what if, there's a, what, if, what, if, what if there's another way? What if, what if we're asking the, the wrong question? What if, what if we ask the opposite question? What if the dead are raised? And, and, and what, if, what if there is eternal life? And what if I am made for purpose? Then what do I gain through suffering? I'm going to land this plane real quick here, okay? Um, here's what, here's what uh, James says. If... If, if we are purpose-built, and, and, and if there, there is a, a meaning to our pain, and if we, if we do, if, if eternal life is at the end of the, the road for us, if we do finish well, then, then Jesus does say, enter in, good and faithful servant. I've prepared a house for you. We will live together for eternity under the shadow of God the Father. James says, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete and lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all. Here's the deal with hedonism. It's not that it promises you or offers you too much in life. It's that it, it offers you too little in life. Hedonism isn't, hedonism isn't us reaching and grasping for more than God would, would have for us. Hedonism is actually like us with alligator arms, just getting what's close to us, but not really living the full potential of all that God has for us. Here's what I mean by this. Hedonism. Like, uh, I have to have a swimming pool, so I can't take the mission trip to Peru. Hedonism. Uh, I have to play it safe and work the job to retirement. I can't work, I can't retire early and go live on a reservation and, 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 and care for little native children and tell them about Jesus. I can't do that because I've got I to retire well so that I can, you know, die five years after I retire. Hedonism, like, ah, I can't chase my dreams. I have to play it safe and, and avoid all pain. And only seek physical pleasure. Meanwhile, you die inside. And if you're betting on the fact that, like, the, that there is no eternal life and that life's just 80 or 90 years, then you're probably making the safe bet. But what if there's eternal life? And what if God has more for you? And what if you're missing out on all the dreams, all the visions, all the plans that he has for you because you're settling for less? 
The big idea is don't spend most of your energy on your circumstances. Avoiding pain at all costs and, and seeking only comfort. Just, just taking the path of, of least resistance. Don't focus mostly on avoiding difficult circumstances. Focus mostly on your heart. God has never promised us that we would not go through the valley of the shadow of death. He's never promised us that. And if someone told you that, that come to Jesus and you will no longer go through the, the valley of the shadow of death, you know, and you, your, your farm will always be fertile and your, your bank account will always be full and, and you'll never get sick and, and your children will never have problems. If someone told you that that's what it means to follow Jesus, they lied to you. God never promised us that he would not go through the valley of the shadow of death. He simply promised that he would go with us. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you, O oh Lord, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What you're going through today, the God of the universe goes with you. When you rest your head on your pillow tonight, he's there in that space with you. You don't go through it alone. There is a resurrection and there is eternal life and there is a purpose to your existence and there is a reason for this season of pain that you're going through. And you can rest knowing that tonight. You see, I, I know many of you very well, and I, I, I think you're strong. I think you're a strong people. Maybe not every one of us, but, but the majority, you're strong. I don't mean physically strong, but strong-willed, strong, strong uh, determination. Like you, you, you want to finish what you start. You're strong, very strong. And you can handle a lot of pain as long as you know there is some reason for this pain. I can make it through the pain. Just don't tell me it's random. Tell me that there's a purpose to it. And I can, like childbirth, for instance. Right? I don't know, but I've seen the pain on my wife's face. But it's for a purpose. What God is doing, he is, he is birthing, sorry ladies, he is birthing something in you. Don't miss that. Maybe we can make this our prayer today. God, I know you are Lord over my circumstances. And I ask that you would Deliver me from my pain, O oh Lord. It's good to ask him that. There's nothing wrong with that. O oh Lord, make, make this your prayer. We don't even have to close our eyes. You can pray with your eyes open. Think, Lord, I know you are Lord over my circumstances. I, I ask that you would deliver me from my pain, but mostly I ask that you would heal my heart. Amen. Would you bow with me now?